Welcome to Let's Talk. Our session today is titled EC Data Works, Advancing Early Childhood Policy and Practice Through Strategic Use of Integrated Data. I'm Debbie Mathias from the BUILD Initiative and Director of the QRIS National Learning Network. Before we begin our session, I'd like to thank the Alliance for Early Success and other generous funders for making this learning community possible. We began this series for state quality administrators and leaders to support their essential work within states around early learning systems building. Quality administrators are welcome to invite other participants as related to the specific content of the call. And we know several of you invited colleagues interested in data, data connectivity, um, and actually using data to inform policy and practice. We have colleagues on the call from over 20 states and territories. We intentionally keep the sessions small to invite conversation and sharing. We hope these calls enable us to illuminate challenges, innovation, and promising practices. After the session, a survey will pop up asking for your suggestions, comments, or questions. We appreciate your input and ideas about the session and will follow up with resources as requested. Also, thinking ahead, let us know if you're working on a promising practice or facing a challenge in your state systems building. Send me an email and we can develop a Let's Talk um, discussion around the topic. Thank you for taking the time to answer the questions when you registered. Many of you provided thoughtful ideas and questions. We reviewed the information at, and it's informing our presentation. Make sure to tr keep track of your questions and examples during the session for our discussion at the end of the session. Enter your thoughts and ideas in the chat box so we can reference those ideas. Many of you in the sign-up mentioned challenges with privacy concerns, working with cross-sector partners, actually getting everyone needed to the table, establishing unique identifiers, matching data, and connecting different database systems. We're going to turn to our panel and hope that they have the answers to all your questions and certainly hey, they have some exciting inf information to present to you today. So I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to our panel. We have Missy Coffey. She's the Assistant Director and Early Childhood Integrated Data System Expert at Applied Engineering Management. We have Anita Larson. She's Minnesota's uh, Early Childhood Integrated Data Systems Coordinator and is working with the EC DataWorks team to build features into their state systems. And our other state panelist is Steve Matherly. He's the Early Childhood Utah Health Program Coordinator at the Utah Department of Health. And he's formerly worked in QRIS, so he's a person that has the big picture ideas as well. And finally, I'd like to introduce Philip Serenides. Philip is um, a statistician and researcher with expertise in the application of quantitative research methods and the development and use of integrated data systems for public sector planning and evaluation. Phil and I used to work together way back in the day in Pennsylvania, and I'd now like to turn it over to Phil to lead us through the presentation. Hi, Phil. Hi, Deb. Thank you. And first, just hats off to you and everyone at BUILD for the amazing conference in Dallas last month. I thought sessions were great, speakers uh, were informative, and, and you always do a, a great job with that, and it's always a lot of fun. Um, so, so congrats and thanks. Uh, today uh, we're excited to talk about the EC DataWorks project, uh, and we have a lot to share, so let's get started. Um, or should I say let's talk? Great. Um, thank you. So. It, it may be a bit provocative, but I don't think controversial to recognize that there is an acknowledged gap in evidence use by public institutions that serve children and families. I think many who are optimistic about the, uh, the potential use for data and evidence, like myself, 
uh, know that state data systems have not yet reached their potential for evidence-based policy and decision-making. And even if we may have different ideas about how data systems could or should lead to improved child and family outcomes, um, it's clear that there's a real gap. And for some evidence, I, I would say we can look even at new federal requirements for state data use and evidence-based decision-making. Um, there have been a continual progressive shift in new federal funding to add requirements related to the use of data and evidence and research. The ESSA is an example, TRIO, legislation such as GIPRA measures. And I think that these are, these are good and a clear signal that shifts toward data use are not consistently happening. Um, so while developing integrated data systems for, for early childhood, uh, are, are useful, if not critical, uh, for evidence-based decision-making, I think to date we, we can say that we still struggle to maximize opportunities for data use. What can we do about this? So we'll go to the next slide. Um, many have diagnosed the, one of the issues as a lack of actionable information. And so one focus for improving evidence-based decision-making has been on addressing this uh, lack of usable information. And to some extent, this is true, but uh, making data useful or actionable is not the same as making it used, and that's not very profound. I think translating data into actionable information is exciting, but if that's our focus, we risk focusing on technology solutions uh, to make information available and, and um, still may end up with um, uh, the need for more assistance to make that useful. So a bigger issue is the lack of capacity within public institutions to leverage and use these data systems. Um, before we go there, okay, we can go there, sure. Um, so we're interested in asking some questions, sort of what is the capacity that, that we're talking about? What is organizational capacity for data use? What does that look like? And um, what are the characteristics of it that contribute to effective and sustainable data use? And even a bigger question, how can we close the gap? How can we develop new data tools that will help address these capacity issues? So EC DataWorks, as we'll describe uh, later, uh, is a project that partners with states to develop some innovative reporting tools, but really the project is about bolstering public institutions um, by building capacity for analytics and use. So here are some more provocative thoughts to, to start us thinking before I turn it over to Missy. One is that uh, one of the reasons that states struggle to, to sort of meet the data demands is that their, their systems were not designed with the proper schemas to, to bring information together in ways that are needed. So it's been, it's been clear for a while that integration is very important. We need to be able to not just collect and store, but link information across systems. I think Newer state systems are doing a better job at this, uh, at integrating data. Uh, it's, it's an area where states are having, I think, the most success. Um, but tech integration will be an ongoing challenge. Uh, and so a second reason that the potential for data to impact policy really may not have been fully realized is that states are, are still in the process of uh, sort of developing strategies for analyzing and reporting the data that's collected and from learning from the data. So developing the analytics has been slower and it started later and often come in response to the availability of raw data. And, and we face an emerging gap between the, the transactional systems that collect and store data and then the state's sort of back-end capacity to access and make use of that. A third reason that, that data resources uh, may be underutilized is that states often don't have a coherent strategy that connects the data with program policy and operations. And this means we need to think about identifying engage, and engaging sort of more, more data users in tool design. And I, I've heard it many times, and I, I know I've said it myself, well, well, first we just need to, to get the data and get it out there and make it available, and, and I can't imagine people not using it. So that may ring a bell or it may ring an alarm bell, but um, making data available may work out 
or you may end up with data that no one really understands or knows what to do with. And I don't want to sound too negative because there are successes happening and I am very optimistic, but there should be, I think, an opportunity for us to give more attention and support for some intentional organizational solutions that, that public sector agencies can implement so that they're able to, to use data effectively and sustainably. So, so now I think I can turn things over to Missy, uh, who, who is great to work with. She's a national expert and, and a good person, so take it away. Thanks, Phil. And thank you guys for joining this afternoon. We're really excited. As you can tell, we have a very passionate team of folks working on EC DataWorks and some great state contributors today that we're really excited about showing you what they've been able to do. So we are going to be, uh, I'm going to provide a very quick overview on the landscape of the field. Uh, Phil is then going to provide a quick overview for those of you who may be new to the EC DataWorks project so you can get a little bit of a sense of what we do. Um, and then we're going to hear and spend most of our time with our state uh, collaborators today to give a sense of what we've been doing in the first year with them and, and what you may be able to leverage from their work to support your own work. Um, and really I think that's how we'll wrap up today is really leveraging our learning so it can support some of you in your own work in your state. So with that, what I'll do is uh, I'll begin by providing a bit of background on early childhood data systems and where the field is currently in the conversation. So many of you may have seen this, press, this slide before. It's the kind, become what we kind of present often around what is an early childhood data system. So let me start by defining what we call an early childhood integrated data system. Um, it really, there's a couple key factors that I think many states came together and said these are the things that are common across all of our early childhood data work. And so this is kind of how the, this definition came to be in 2014. So as you can see from the slide, um, the states really focus on the ability of the system to be able to collect, integrate, maintain, store, report, and report information on the early childhood programs. As Phil's already mentioned, I think many states are moving more and more into the reporting out information from their systems, but there's still many states who are working on the integration itself. Or there's systems who are working to integrate new programs into the EC idea. Part of the definition also includes this idea that there's multiple agencies included, people who are serving ages uh, birth through age eight. So it also incorporates the K-12 system. So there's a direct partnership with the, typically the SLDS or a state, uh, state SIS, which is typically the statewide information system for the students. And then finally, um, really this, these systems have varied traditionally, but the goal is to have uh, child information, family information, classroom information, and program information really captured at these levels to be able to answer questions that can't be answered already. So at a high level, that's uh, the definition of what we're talking about today for an early child integrated data system. I think we're excited to be able to kind of come in and uh, talk a little bit about why these systems are created. So if we look at uh, how states have actually started to develop and the reason for why these systems have come to be, I think there's a couple key themes. Um, one is really specifically around the accurate, being able to accurately describe access and availability of programs across the state as well as the local communities. I think states have been really working to be able to get a better view of where children are, where the gaps are in their field so they can get more resources out to those communities. Beyond that, states really want to be able to use data to inform um, their decisions. We've been able to document there are many states who are working on the transition data, school readiness data, and there's a lot of different family and child outcomes that states are looking at. And these are all areas in which one program's data can't really be able to use any one of those particular areas. They're, they're all reasons in which states are saying no one program has all the information. We need to look across programs to get a better view of the, the way that these children are receiving services across the state. And then finally, I think the other reason is that we see this shift that Phil was talking about a few minutes ago that there is a federal shift happening from going beyond compliance and moving more into continuous improvement. It's being written in our current performance standards for Head Start. There's a focus on state systemic improvement plans out of the special ed. And so we're seeing this shift happening across multiple programs and I think with that comes a need to be able to better use data outside of these program areas so that they can report accurately and be able to improve their own program decisions. So, What's the history then? So in 2009, you know, I think there were a couple states working towards this, including Pennsylvania, that were using either state funding or a little bit of foundation funding to be able to develop these in, in an effort to be able to support the systems building conversations. 
But in 2009, the SLDS program used RF fundings to extend the data system grants to include early childhood. And that's kind of where we start the inception of this. While we know that there were things that were happening before, that was really where the federal influence became a larger player in the conversations. And we went from a handful of states to a much larger cohort of states working on ECIDX. Since then, other funding areas, including ECCS grants, the ELC grants, and others have supported state developments. And as you can tell from this map, there's lots of different folk, um, funding mechanisms that have been used to start the conversations in states. The important thing, though, is as we've learned, and obviously it's been a long time since 2009, um, as we've learned, many states have now created or are working to create these ECIDSs. They're becoming more and more operational. Every year we have a couple more becoming operational in their first or second phase of development. But not all of them are staying active. And when funding decreases or goes away with funds like ELC, part of the need for states is to build sustainable models beyond grant funding. And so we looked at current models um, about some, how some of the states that you often probably hear about when we talk about the ECIDS, and two of them are call with us today, you hear about different ways that states have done this, right? Pennsylvania had started with some of the foundation supporting, really supplemented it with the federal support to be able to develop that, the mechanisms. Minnesota successfully used their ELC support, their ELC grant, sorry, um, to then go after and structure in such a way that they went, then went after an SLDS grant and then successfully moved from that to use the EC DataWorks project as a supplemental resource to develop analytic tools. Um, North Carolina, I think Dale's on the call today, was able to really use their ELC grant but then transitioned into state budgets. So that's a different model, right? Being able to look at state funding to sustain their work. And then finally, Utah used their ECCS grant to start the, the model, uh, to start the conversation, but then has been able to use funds like EC DataWorks to support and supplement those federal resources to build out analytics. And so I think there's lots of different ways, and I think that's what we want to highlight for you all today, is that there is no one way that a state is developing this work. Um, it's really being driven by the state's needs and what their requests are and where they are in the process. In addition to that, there are direct state, in, I'm sorry, in addition to the direct state grants, there are also many free resources to states. And we'd be remiss not to recognize that some, some of them, for instance. The uh, infrastructure work and some of the data use work is actually happening and been supported from, from federal TA from ELC, the SLDS program, Common Education Data Standards, we call CEDS, the Privacy Technical Assistance Center, PTAC. Um, there's other for states who are looking more for research partnerships or learning how to better use their data, they're partnering with RELs like Washington did to create their early learning report. And there's many other states who are working directly with their university partners to be able to look at the data that they do have and build out models from there. In addition, we have advocacy and communications that's come from our partners over at um, Early Childhood Data Collaborative. And then there's also folks that are specifically looking at uh, program promotion and how do we actually help specific programs like Head Start or, or um, special education to integrate into these ECIDS conversations and to be prepared to be a partner at the table. So then we have centers like DAISY, ECTA, or ECHO who are really looking at how to help promote some of those specific programs into the conversation. And because of all of that and because of the time that this has naturally happened since 2009, um, I think just given the funding, and you can see that there's various funding models that have gone to, into this, there's also just been a shift. Uh, Phil recognized this early on in the call, right? As states have developed these, as there's new federal regulations, as there's new system efforts happening in states, it's only natural that shifts are going to occur. And as we learn more, we've realized that some of these are really critical, and we're seeing a couple of common themes across the states as the shifts are going. One is that we're seeing a definite shift from building data system infrastructure to data use. And this is reflected not only in where states are and kind of uh, where now that they've had some even very basic infrastructure moving into looking at how they're using data, but the Department of Ed, um, HHS, they're the funding mechanisms, right? Foundation funding, they're no longer looking at, hey, we want to fund your system as much as we want to be able to look at how you're going to use data to inform practice. And if you need some infrastructure, then that's one thing. So even just looking at some of the basic shifts like that. The other shift we've seen, and I referenced in terms of even the federal regulations, comes from the shift from compliance to the shift to continuous improvement. And I think that's a, I think this comes from a long history of accountability and wanting to move beyond that into kind of how do we use the information that we now have to make better decisions. And then finally, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about data integration itself. 
Um, as we all know, technology moves faster and faster each year, and so as the differences that have happened even in the last decade or so, data integration has become easier. But it's also in, allowed us to do different things with our data. Um, so things like data visualization tools and cloud-based technology are now here and kind of present where they might not have been a, a decade ago for state agencies. So recently, states are realizing that this technology is not what's keeping the work from happening. We have to understand and be able to communicate how the data can and should be used to actually take action. And so we're going to continue to reiterate that. You'll see that theme across EC DataWorks. Um, but also to think about how do you embed data into a larger systems conversation, right? Data should not be in its own thing, but really embedding it into a much larger conversation so it is more sustainable and really can help take action from that. And also, I think the other key challenge states have recognized is that developing this capacity that Phil was talking about is really the critical piece. It's not the technology that's holding us back anymore as much as the, do we have the capacity in our state to be able to use this data and with our own skill sets, with our organizations, and with kind of the information that we need in order to actually um, take action from the data itself. So we, we kept, keep coming back to this idea. If the challenge is that we need to be able to build capacity for effective use, then what does that look like? And so to meet these needs, states are looking at this in lots of different ways. And I think one of the ways is by looking at both their organizations and saying, where do we, where do we currently have capacity in our state? Who, do we help, who helps us with our own data? Um, if we have questions, not just the data collection and reporting, but who's actually helping us to think about um, how to make it understandable, how to interpret data, who do you have within your agency to help you think that through? States are also looking specifically at the literature, right? And more and more we're, we're seeing from the literature what's coming out around capacity. Um, there's a lot in the K-12 literature that I think we can learn from an early childhood. But there's things like what is organization capacity and how do we assess how that can help us to better use data. Things about practitioner or teacher capacity, I think there's a lot of specifically in education looking at teacher and um, administrator capacity. But there's also a larger field, I think, now, as you can see from the dates, are people who are looking at practitioner capacity to use data. And then also the behavior change, right? We have to understand that there's a lot of shifts happening in this field and such. And so the behavior change alone needs to be accounted for. So using the literature from that to understand how that could influence our work is really important. And this is really where we see um, EC DataWorks fitting in. So we as a group have really recognized that while there is a lot of resources out there to help states right now build the infrastructure, there's resources in, in terms of the technical assistance for every state, there's free resources for that. But really looking at this capacity area and, and really focusing on that is really where we see EC DataWorks has been able to help, and we want to be able to help build the knowledge base so that you as states can look at the specific things within your organizations, within your own skill sets, within your teams, and say, this is what we need in order to be effective long term. And so as Phil was describing, we want to help you identify what specific capacity is needed in your states so that you can be successful in taking action from your data beyond the life of any given grant. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Phil. He's going to talk a little bit about EC DataWorks to give you some background on our project. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Missy. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of hit some of the highlights. EC DataWorks um, is, is a project that is um, supported by a grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And um, it, the project was developed so that um, we can bring a, a team together to partner with states around the, the design and implementation of one new innovative report that leverages existing uh, state data. Uh, and so uh, part of the value is, is, is bringing resources to be able to design and actually implement a new report. Um, and we also see value um, added to the partner states uh, in terms of using sort of our specific approach that also addresses some of the non-technical factors. Um, so so we, we work very collaboratively. Um, you know, we're, we are uh, working with states we have bi-monthly bi calls, lots of on-site visits, lots of stakeholder engagements. It's a, it's a very close partnership that we're honored to, to be able to have with, with the states. Um, and so the main idea, prob probably what I'd say maybe as a hypothesis, is that in order to achieve effective and sustainable use of, of these ECIDSs, it's going to involve a lot of work in a combination of technical and non-technical factors. So, um, so yeah, that, we can go to the next slide. Our team uh, is wonderful. We have a multidisciplinary team with a lot of collective experience uh, working with states and at the national level. 
and it's it's um, it's something that you know we we we're uh, recognizing there's a breadth of different skills and experiences that are really required for this work in terms of designing and implementing uh, from the front end and the back end and the user support and the governance and much more. So uh, this project is is, uh, is 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 based out of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where where I am and and some others, uh, Valerie Holt, Yolanda Green. Uh, Bridget and and we are in partnership with national experts at AEM and also innovative innovators at, at Third Sector Intelligence and glad to have all of our team members um, part of part of this work. But our team would not get very far without state collaborators that have partnered with us. Uh, Minnesota and Utah were were in the first round round two awards. Uh, brought us uh, to Georgia and Texas and I just want to thank the great people in each of the states. For, for the opportunities to partner, one of whom uh, I think I'll now hand things over to. Dr. Larson, would you like to take it away? Sure. Thank you, Phil. Um, in Minnesota, we took uh, this opportunity because of uh, where we were at in terms of our work. Um, we, we built our system using Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Funds. And if any of you have been in a similar situation where you receive funding, someone else wrote the grant, um, you get hired as the coordinator of this enormous project and you're already behind, you're really faced with the prospect of building um, the best system you can based on the data that's contributed, that's been committed, and that often drives who the potential users are going to be. So in our case, we ended up really focusing on users who would be local uh, planners, and this for us would be in, at the county level, in school districts. Uh, we also do a lot of state planning using legislative districts. And so we really focused on that, and that was driven um, by things like the age of the data that would become available, the data practices and privacy concerns that our state agencies had. For example, they were unwilling to release identified data, student level data to users. So we knew the system wouldn't necessarily be useful to teachers on the ground, but any program or jurisdiction that wanted to do local planning should be able to use the system. What we did, therefore, was um, really built a system that was built for other nerdy data people like us um, who love to do a lot of filtering and have a lot of options. And so if you've spent any time on our site and you're one of those nerdy data people, you can easily spend a few hours on our site because there's so many options. Um, on the one hand, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about that because it's really fun for data people to use our site. On the other, um, we, there was a whole group of users that we really weren't thinking about and our assumptions about um, the fun features of our site that everyone would be equally excited about it were incorrect. Uh, we, we made this assumption that if you build it, it they will come. Everyone's going to love the site and that's not what happened. Um, the, the stakeholder group, in fact, that we neglected was leadership, people who were in um, high levels and uh, who don't have a lot of time, energy, or desire to learn how to use our site. Uh, they tend to be very busy people, important people, and um, unfortunately, they were the very people that we need to engage right now as we continue to try to seek state funding to maintain our system. So when EC DataWorks came along, we knew this was a great opportunity for us to be able to develop something from our site that would take advantage of all the great information that we'd integrated, um, but create almost a point and click and go uh, feature for the busy leadership users that we needed to engage. So that's exactly what we've been doing. Um, we're really working on building the capacity of those leaders to use our site. Uh, and in doing so, our EC DataWorks team, uh, we had a meeting in June, 
and um, they're going to be spending some time talking with the stakeholders we invited. And we invited folks who represented leaders from county level, uh, state, our state legislature, our House and Senate research staff were represented. Um, we had some school district staff there and uh, really wanting to get their feedback about what it is they need. What kind of information do they need about children and families in order to make better decisions about policy and laws? Uh, what we, our ongoing challenges really uh, have to be mindful of the fact that it takes so much time to understand our site and, um, and that we, there's, just, there's a whole sector of the population that just doesn't get as excited about data systems as we do and um, we, we need to recognize that. But they still need the information that it contains and can provide to them to inf um, inform their decisions. So right now, our goal working with EC Data Works is to really produce a, a product and a tool from our site that will be useful for executive level staff and state leaders. And so we're at the point of identifying what that might look like, um, describing some of the data stories that would be most effective and useful for that population of folks. Um, and with the, with the intent, um, and this is aligning with our whole capacity building conversation today, that uh, we, we can pique their curiosity, we can um, inflame their passion for data, and get them to go back to the site and learn how to use it once they get a taste for what they can get from the site. So those are our goals. Great. Thanks, Anita. Yep. I think what Anita is highlighting, I think, for others to kind of learn from is that we, throughout the process of working with Minnesota, really saw the importance of stakeholder engagement. But I'm going to say strategic stakeholder engagement. I think for many of us who've been working on really any initiative in a state, you have your stakeholders, and that's no different with data systems. Um, but as these become more advanced or become operational, what we're finding is that, to Anita's point earlier, there is really a need to be a little bit more strategic and thoughtful about, well, who's currently engaged? How do we leverage what we already have? But then also engage some new groups. And so some of that really meant that as through some of our work on EC Data Works, we've been engaging um, new groups and new stakeholders and conducting a needs assessment to better understand really what is it that they want to do. And not just say, hey, what could this data system do for you? But to really think about, as you can see in the graphic next to us, be able to say, okay, what are some of the questions? Um, how are you collecting data? What kinds of, how would you answer that question, right? We've been talking about uh, answering questions from, from these data systems for such a long time, but what we've missed is an opportunity to really start to move beyond that and say, okay, so it's great if we were to say that there's 803 kids in this program, so what? And so what we're working on with Minnesota is working with these stakeholders to say, okay, what kind of data stories are you trying to tell? What kind of messages are you trying to make? Um, and be able to communicate so that this data system that they now have can be able to make to turn the information into actionable um, decisions. And so that really took the needs assessment. I think it took some collaborative goal setting with the state. And I think the state had a couple iterations of working with their leadership to figure out what would really make uh, this product successful for them in their next phase of work. Um, I would say targeted stakeholder engagement that meant a lot of more of the smaller focus groups with the people who would be the intended users of this data hub, and then really using that to help create these data stories. I think we hear a lot about creating data stories in general, but really working with the users themselves to understand what kind of stories they're already telling or what they would like to be able to tell. And that's some of what we've been able to learn this year with Minnesota specifically. So thank you, Anita, for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Steve, who's going to share a little bit about the insight from Utah. <coughs> hey, welcome. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Hello? Yes. Oh, good, good. Well, welcome, and uh, thank you, everybody, for taking your time out of your day to listen to us today. I'd like to give you a little background on REC IDS, which we call eKids. So if you hear me say eKids, then I'm, I'm also talking about our EC IDS. And if I can give you some background on our eKids, that will help uh, lead to the context of our involvement and our relationship with EC DataWorks and this wonderful uh, tool that we are in the process of, of developing. Um, in Utah, we began the thought, the ideas of developing our eKids in the fall of 2011. 
And um, we've been in active pursuit of, of that goal uh, since 2012. We're in a little bit unique setting in, in that we're at the Department of Health versus a Department of Ed or a, a combo Department of Ed, early learning, um, like some states have. And, and with that comes you know, some pros and some cons and, and some challenges. Uh, Debbie said at the beginning of the webinar, we, we, we might have all the answers. Uh, I don't know about that, but we can definitely confirm this is very difficult, hard, and challenging work, but uh, ho hopefully it also leads to some uh, great rewards uh, for your early childhood uh, stakeholders and, and, and policymakers. So we, we had our uh, data sharing agreements originally signed in 2013, and we're working on revising them now to reflect the, the current uh, landscape. And what's taken us so long, really, is that we had to develop, uh, build our, our matching uh, machine, if you will, our, our ETL, our extract and transform and, and load, our, our matcher uh, software and machine. And we had to do that in, in order to benefit the entire uh, Department of Health and our eKids is a, is a, is a branch uh, from that, a satellite uh, system related to that. So now our uh, matcher machine, our Department of Health Master Person Index is built and it's up and it's running and we're now uh, doing some beta testing with some of our eKids uh, data sources. Um, nine different programs are uh, contemplating uh, participating in our eKids. Internal to the Department of Health, we have the Office of Home Visiting, McVie Home Visiting, IDEA, uh, IDEA Part C, WIC. Um, we have an Early Childhood Developmental Screening Program. Uh, at the Department of Health, we also have access to vital records, our birth and death registry, as well as Medicaid and CHIP uh, data through the All Payer Claims Database. Um, these da various uh, data sources will work together to help us identify a, a unique child, a distinct child. Some of our external sources are uh, off, uh, child care subsidy uh, slash enrollment, child care enrollment, uh, early Head Start and Head Start, as well as our local uh, Help Me Grow. So by combining these various uh, data sources and then being able to ping up against our vital records and, and Medicaid data and, and each other, that will help us to um, uh, identify the first thing, one of the major things in an in a eKids, ECIDS, is to be able to produce a distinct count of a unique child and, and, then, and, then, and then discover which program or programs is serving that child and how about the order or the sequence of that participation? And then, of course, ultimately, we want to match our records with the K through 12 uh, database and uh, the SLDS, Statewide Longitudinal Data System, in order to see uh, you know, what kind of outcomes uh, children that have participated in these early childhood programs, well, you know, what difference did we make? Uh, with regards to school readiness and social and emotional adjustments and things of that nature. So as, as our eKids was coming along, we began to show our uh, mock reports to our stakeholders that, uh, that displayed this distinct count and program participation and, and the sequence of the order. And uh, we got a, uh, similar to what uh, Anita is saying, we had some assumptions uh, uh, about the excitement <laughs> of our, uh, you know, data partners and data sources. And while they appreciated uh, our ability to produce those reports, we uh, quickly got a, a message, hey, this is wonderful, but we need more. We need a much more comprehensive picture of what's going on out there in our state and our counties and our communities. And so that we can make, have a clear picture, uh, context for this data, so that we can make uh, informed policy decisions, and so that this data can contribute to our, our uh, charge to do community assessments like uh, Early Head Start and Head Start need to do, as well as child care. And of course, with regards to our state and federal funding requests, we need a more comprehensive uh, uh, picture. Um, and without uh, having to go through um, a laborious IRB approval and, and research-based program evaluation, which we will still do, but uh, those are uh, you know, painstaking and they take a lot of time and funding. So our, our, our colleagues, our stakeholders say, hey, 
We want something like these reports that are coming out of, of Maryland and, and Kentucky with regards to school readiness, and we want a website that looks like, you know, North Carolina and Minnesota. We, you know, we, we want all of this. And then so, uh, you know, in, in the end, we really want to know what difference our programs and our interventions made and uh, what, di what adjustments do we need to make. Are, are we missing certain populations of, of children? Where are our services falling short, and what can we do to improve not only our program, but our system, our early childhood system, in the name of collective impact? I mean, that's what integrated data systems are all about. How can we bring in all these different data and look at uh, what individual programs are doing, but what about a broader system? What is our collective impact on that family and that child's level of, of school uh, readiness? And then so there was lots of challenges with that and, and things were you know, whistling, uh, whistling around in, in my mind. And then uh, you know, along, along came our opportunity with early childhood uh, uh, data works. And uh, we, we talked about these things, we assessed our situation and uh, we brought all of our stakeholders together for several meetings. And then the challenge was how can we create one tool that will benefit all these various programs and, and be able to offer context and, and data and, and the crucial information for such a wide variety of, of stakeholders. And so through this uh, stakeholder engagement and through working with the professionals at EC DataWorks, um, we're uh, developing a, a, a tool, a early childhood community profile tool that has uh, static uh, data tables as well as interactive, uh, you know, data tables. Um, the, the idea is how can we use the er Utah's early childhood integrated data system, the data that we already have, how can we supplement that with other data sets that are publicly available such as American Community Survey and census data, as well as kids count data. How can we put all this in, in, into one tool and make it informative and useful for all of our uh, partners? So you know, that's what we've been working on developing. We're still in the very early stages, and uh, we can move on to the next slide now, I believe. And I, I, I'm sure that you, you know, won't be able to see all the detail that you'd like to on this slide, so we'll make sure that we make uh, the PDF available to you after, and we've even recorded an interactive uh, demo uh, of this tool. Um, unless you see the interactive demo, you really can't uh, tell how, how powerful uh, you know, this, this can be. But the user will, will uh, arrive at a page that, that uh, uh, displays a map of Utah and, and various drop-downs uh, that you can uh, select and uh, show us the, the, the number of programs that are in a given county or perhaps drill it down further to a zip code or, or a zip code level or di legisla legislative uh, district. And then, so uh, what does that area look like? What, what about the population? H how many children, uh, zero to five, zero to eight, do we have in that region? H how many families are in poverty in, in that region? And what type of poverty? Uh, uh, what, what's the threshold there to, to give us an idea of which programs uh, those families and those children may be eligible for. And then, okay, if they're eligible, well, which programs are actually in the area? Uh, how many services can that family access? And, and then to go a step further, well, from our eKids data, which families are actually accessing uh, those programs? And then, of course, we have placeholders, uh, you know, for outcome data, uh, such as what is our kindergarten entry assessments telling us about the children that participated in the various programs. Um, we have placeholders for inter intergenerational poverty. How, how are those kids being served and what type of uh, difference are we making there? Um, other interesting uh, data sets that we hope to integrate would be uh, risk factors at birth, such as some of the risk factors associated with the mom and with the family, such as education level or low birth weight and, and things of that nature. And as you uh, interact with this map, it can give you percentages or accounts in order to offer uh, the, the context. You can show the next slide, Missy. Now, I know that also might be tough to see, but 
like I mentioned, uh, we will send this to you. But that is the exciting uh, tool that we are working with Early Childhood Data Works uh, to develop. And uh, that way, as Anita mentioned, uh, busy uh, executive level uh, management, policymakers, legislators can, can go to our site and, and with a simple, very intuitive um, you know, direction, be able to click and, and go. And once you select a, a, a county uh, throughout the report, uh, you can compare uh, one county to another, uh, to different regions, so that you can really have a context uh, for, the, you know, for the report and pull the information that is most applicable uh, to your needs, whether it's policy or, or funding requests, uh, you know, uh, outcomes, uh, things, uh, things of that nature. And, and so what we will make available to you and what we're describing today is, is really the ideal. Um, it might, obviously, it might look a little bit different, uh, you know, upon launch, but uh, we're, we're starting with the ideal and, the, uh, you know, the pie in the sky kind of thing, and then we'll uh, uh, build upon that, uh, create that infrastructure and, and build upon that uh, for years. Uh, one thing that has helped us uh, quite a bit recently are a, a couple of Senate bills here in Utah that do call uh, for a mapping of all the early childhood services and, and an assessment of, of what's going on throughout Utah and what type of impact, uh, as well as an integrated uh, data research center, if you will, so that we can uh, determine what type of uh, positive outcomes our families are experiencing due to our programs or interventions or what type of adjustments uh, you know, we need to make over time. And I believe uh, that's uh, everything that I have to present, and I'm sure there will be some questions uh, later, but uh, thank you. That's great, Steve. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I think designing a report is challenging, and definitely designing a report for someone else to use um, can, can be a, a bit dubious. So we wanted to start with the end in mind, uh, when, when thinking about the design of, of any tool. And for us, the, the end point uh, is really where the state wanted to see uh, themselves in, in a year or in five years. Uh, and the, the end state is, is not a data report or it's not even data use. It's sort of the, the outcomes, the policies and the services um, that, that are, are the priorities in the state. And so we identify first a, a, a clear goal uh, and then map out the activities required sort of to reach that outcome. And, and then I think it becomes appropriate to consider how data can be leveraged to help facilitate, uh, facilitate and enhance those activities. So this, is, this, this may be a, a subtle, but I think an important difference from how uh, we often think about the sequencing uh, and design of data systems and reports. In, in my experience uh, is that sort of states first focus on collecting data and making it available before thinking about the, the analytics and capacity for, for, uh, for use. And having worked firsthand on, on state systems, I'm, I'm definitely in, in this category. Um, but it, it can create some uncomfortable downward pressure on people to sort of discover uses for, for whatever data you have in hand. And so um, we know that with that data itself does not give us answers. It just really leads to questions. So EC DataWorks wants to start with the goals, work out a pathway, and then try to close those capacity gaps through, through a tool, through designing and implementing some data reporting tool. And so in Utah, just as with Minnesota, we wanted to start with the end in mind. Anita and Missy really explained, I think, that you know, Minnesota had an impressive amount of data that was available but was underutilized. Um, and you know, why is that? Well, state leaders wanted to use data to explain what they're doing and why, and dashboards and, 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 and other tools help a little, but if the goal is to communicate, then the technology needs to be designed to serve that goal. And so as they said in Minnesota, yeah, EC DataWorks is, is really designing a tool with, with that intent for users to be able to construct message points and, and, and data stories, and how then technology and reporting solutions can, can help you know, them with that clear need to leverage the data for communications. So our hope there is that users will say, you know, what I've been saying before, I can now more substantively say with data. And in Utah, we had a very similar approach. You know, someone needs something in order to do something. 
some goal or task. And there was a need in Utah to support local groups in their coordination and planning and implementation of, of local services. There are many great examples in states, and Annie Casey does a fantastic job of, of providing information in ways that are organized sort of, sort of geographic areas. Um, and as we designed the Utah Community Profile, we knew that making data available is not going to be enough. So that's what Steve was saying, really engaging stakeholders to articulate what actions sort of local leaders plan to take when offered with this data. And that was incredibly important because it led us to see there was just many diverse uses, you know, as, as Steve was saying, needs assessment, you know, infrastructure development, uh, addressing access gaps, advocacy, uh, improvement, and more. Our, our response to, to take that and then to sort of develop a framework for organizing data within the community profiles that are sort of based on the different types of specific activities that the users were, were envisioning. And four buckets emerged for us, and so we've, we've structured the Utah's community profile in sort of a simple framework that, that uh, is, is um, referred to as EASI, uh, stands for Eligibility, Access, Services, and Improvement. And I, I think we're going to have some materials from the project coming out soon to describe that in more detail. But certainly there's different ways to organize data in terms of the source system or the level of the data. And data can be used for mo many purposes. So this framework we're working now to help local, uh, local users focus on giving the, the data together, organized in a way that will um, help them uh, with, with their actions and decisions for making improvements uh, for, for programs and for services. Um, and so, and so that, that's part of our, our strategy here is to really begin with the end in mind. All right, so that's... Um, See, leveraging, our, okay, a big idea for EC DataWorks really, as we've said, is that there's going to be a combination of technical and non-technical sort of capacities for analytics that are important. So we as a, as a project think that there are some opportunities for, for learning uh, from this experience. And in, in some ways, EC DataWorks I think of as, as one particular intervention. And it's not the only one you could imagine, but it's a, it's a strategy for helping to facilitate really a, a process to develop uh, a number of different capacities together. And so our, our intent and our hope, returning here to this opening statement, is that we know this work isn't easy and the challenges that, that uh, states face in using data are becoming better understood, uh, even as the expectations are, seem to also be rapidly increasing. But now that we're at this critical stage nationally, right, we want to be able to move this technology into effective use. I find it helpful to think about the process of uh, system design and then leading to analytics and then into the, the organizational use. I find it helpful to think about it as having a logical sequence but not a chronological sequence. Um, we need to work on all of these at the same time and certainly you can't perform analytics without having some data but that does not mean that the capacities that we're, uh, you know, uh, envisioning as being important here cannot all be sort of worked on uh, together. So even as we're thinking about sound schemas that are going to assemble infra information in ways uh, that are useful, we don't want to wait for more data to be collected and integrated before sort of mapping out use cases, right, that are going to help position that data and evidence in the day-to-day -day decision making. So we know that, that this work is, is expensive and it's time consuming. And it is very hard to step back and be reflective. And part of what uh, this project uh, is doing, in, in addition to the technology and the TA, is, is, to think, uh, is to help think about what elements, right, from this outsider reflective role, um, what are the non-technical challenges, right? And then to think about how, at the end of the day, we're going to um, have a report and we want to make sure that we're going to maximize its use. So beginning with that, that end in mind. Um, it's a different role for technology in a sense because rather than thinking about the technology as just simply providing us with a platform to, to operate on, we want to think about how data reports and how technology can help us address some of the capacity issues, how they can improve and enhance the work that people are already doing. 
So we're grateful for the opportunity to be working with these states. I think this is exciting work, and we're glad, uh, so thankful for our, our sponsor, uh, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, that, that has made this possible uh, for us. And that leads us, I think, to what's next. Yeah, okay, let's, let's go on from this slide. Right. Um, we are now, um, as we, as we um, move into sort of this, this next phase of work with, with Utah and Minnesota and begin with Georgia and Texas, as we've said, are going to also be launching some, uh, some new, new um, opportunities online for other states to learn about and get involved, and that will include some uh, so, uh, collaborative common space through CPRI's Knowledge Hub which is a great resource, and we hope to uh, be able to really leverage this to create space for states to discuss challenges and, and learn about uh, what, what is working and also what are some of the uh, opportunities to, to partner uh, with, with other states or with other organizations um, to, to move the work forward. So here are two, two links that, that will be um, places you could go to learn more about, about this effort. Thank you guys so much for this presentation. We have a couple of questions that were um, submitted ahead of time or, and that we would like to address. So we'll just take a few moments. Um, could you say a little bit more, Phil, about the um, partnership with, with um, EC Data Works that you were discussing here in terms of like how would states apply to get involved or a little bit about what's their commitment to the process of being a partner with EC Data Works. Now, I'm understanding that some of the resources you described here would be available to non-directly participating states as like a 50-state strategy, but just could you fill in some gaps there? Yeah. I, our, um Having worked, you know, in different ways with different states, I, I think it was clear to me that, uh, you know, this work in, just requires um, a lot of, of um, sort of responsive, um, close um, uh, partnership work, and it, 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 it involves face-to-face uh, -face time. There's, I mean, our, our, our team um, is, is uh, in each state is wonderful in, just in terms of making themselves Available because because it's 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 a lot of work it's expensive and it's time consuming and so we we understand that and so we as a as a project are organized so that we we really uh, partner with states and then focus heavily on on helping them to leverage what they have already built in their ECIDS um, to to sort of move to the next level in innovative reporting with in mind the thought that in order for this to be useful we need to. Uh, consider all of the use cases and, capacity and, and supports that are going to be also required. So we, we have a, a sort of a, a project that so far has been very focused on a, on a set of partner states. And at the same time, I think we're just so interested and excited about work in, in many other states that we are looking for opportunities to also start making connections with, with, with others. That, and so that's, that's part of the intent behind the CPRI Knowledge Hub common space that, that we're, we'll be launching this year as a way for people to, to remain connected. And, and at some point, we are also going to be moving to, to identify uh, two more states that, that, are, that are going to, um, you know, uh, hopefully work with us to, 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 to do uh, sort of what we've been already uh, successful in, in, in our, our current partnerships. And when that happens, you know, we'll, we'll try to put that up on billboards and, and, and make that information very available to others so that folks uh, in states that are interested in this type of partnership work with us, we'd be honored to, to talk with you about that and, and can have an opportunity to, to, to apply for that. Missy, are there other things uh, to put you on the spot here that you think that would be useful? I mean, something I, I'd like to mention too, which, which, is, uh, which has been a, a great opportunity for this project is not only for us to work with states and, and sort of do our own thing uh, to support the state priorities, but in ways that we've actively partnered with other sort of TA centers um, and, and national initiatives that have been going on in ways that I think create some more continuity and coherence among, among the supports that states have access to. And so, 
you know, working even with some of the TA center work that, that Missy is also leading is, is a way for states to, to connect with and benefit from the EC Data Works project. Yeah, and I would just add, I think some of the specific ways are for those who are trying to look at what Minnesota and uh, Utah created, for instance, we're leveraging that to try to, as EC Data Works partnering with some of the national centers from SLDS to partner and find out how do you create templates and models using uh, CEDS that are kind of considered as a privacy needs, but also being able to build out so you guys can have templates and, and guides that could actually, you could say, hey, I really like what Utah created. How could I do something similar in my state? Uh, so we're trying to create and leverage what we're doing on EC Data Works to build it out to the state, to, with other TA centers that might have a more global reach to be able to take and create some resources that will help to be able to message that out broadly and be able to share these lessons learned, I think, with other states. So if you're a state that says, hey, Steve has is pretty cool. I'd like to do something like that in my state that we could be able to share something with you and be able to give you some very clear kind of both considerations but also just guidance. And, and Ruth, who's on our team, is great about thinking about the analytic support that you'll have to consider as a state wanting to do more of that. So I think that's another great way to be involved, and you'll see more of that coming out in the fall. Mm -hmm. Steve, you talked a little bit, well, before I get to, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a few more examples of big questions that people were asking, and you talked about um, how can we uh, exert our funding in terms of reach or risk and understand the communities um, more strongly and the needs of families and children? Um, but you mentioned, um, uh, Missy, privacy concerns. Has that, like, you have help for states? Because I noticed that in some of the upfront sign-up questions, people were really thinking about privacy concerns or the legislators being concerned about privacy. Um, is that typically a question that states really come forward with first and foremost? How do we do this while still considering that? Yeah, this is Missy. I think that every state probably starts there and wants to better mm -hmm. understand what the privacy, how to do this work with the constraints of FERPA and HIPAA in particular relating to early childhood. But we've had great partnerships with the Privacy Technical Assistance Center that has a lot of guidance in a specific section just on early um, childhood. And states who have specific needs have been able to le leverage their technical assistance. So we've really tried to partner so the message is consistent across. But they do things like reviewing MOUs for you all um, in your states, coming on site. And when we do on-site meetings, when there's specific needs that we're developing or if there's tools that we're developing, They'll take a look and say, hey, here are some of the things you're going to want to consider to make sure that the privacy and confidentiality is maintained of all those individuals. So they've been a great partner in the work. Well, I see we have a question in the, um, from Padma. Can you unmute yourself and ask away? It's star seven to unmute. Padma, I can't hear you yet. All right, I'll get started and Padma, if you can um, unmute yourself, then you can jump in. Um, she, how do I, okay. She was asking a question about if um, I think any I of the- started. Can you hear me? Oh. Now? Thank you. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I have a little technically challenged there for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to ask is I think one of you mentioned something about the unique child identifier that kind of starts very early on and can also connect up to the K-12 system. Is that working effectively or did I, was I just dreaming that because I wanted that to happen here in Florida? Hello, Steve. Yeah, I, okay. Cool. I, that might be in reference to uh, my presentation, and <clears throat> and yes, that that would make life much easier <laughs> for data integration. But uh, we're going to have a number. Uh, it, it's not a unique identifier that is assigned at at birth and then able to uh, travel with the child through all these various systems. Rather, it's an identifier that we will be able to create once uh, various programs intersect 
with our early childhood integrated data system, then we will cr create an, an eKids uh, unique identifier. And then we will query the K-12 through 12, uh, database. They also have their own unique identifier. So then it's really a matter of matching um, identifiers from various systems. And then so we'll have our unique identifier. We'll match that with the K-12 through 12, as well as the SLDS uh, uh, longitudinal identifier. And then that will really open the doors. Then, then the associated program, like in this example, the Utah State Board of Education can then uh, pull the records uh, that are necessary uh, for the early childhood research. For example, we'll be able to say to them, okay, now that you've shared your, uh, they call it the SSID, Statewide Student Identifier. Mm -hmm. now, that we're, now that we've been able to uh, match our eKids identifier with uh, your identifier, now we can tell, uh, the researchers can approach that K-12 through governing body and say, okay, we would like to be able to study all of the uh, uh, child care or, or Head Start or whatever the example is, then the, the school will know, okay, here's the SSIDs uh, that we need to pull the records, and then they can properly de-identify those records, and then the research can go forward. Okay, I think that's what I meant, not um, right from birth, but uh, through the subsidized child care or the yeah. CDS. Or oh, uh, great, great. I uh, hope that answers your question. And Yeah, we, I, I think at first we, we hoped that we could do something at birth with our association with vital records, and, but no, that, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> no, yeah. Right. Thank Missy, you. have you seen another example or how people are linking unique identifiers I think that this is a big entanglement that states have to get through in order to, to proceed on this. Do you, do you have anything else you'd like to say there? Um, I would be glad to share some of the things. I also wonder if Anita, do you want to share what you guys did in Minnesota? Well, I'm thinking through the parts of our systems where we've tried to um, extend the use of our education unique identifier down into other uh, pre-K programming. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is our Head Start programs now have the opportunity to assign an education identifier for their children through um, kind of a, an extension of our, our education ID assignment process called EE student, which stands for Early Education Student. And, and this is something that actually programs, pre-K programs in our state that were not affiliated formally with the school district um, really were clamoring for long before we began doing unique, uh, or long before we began building integrated data systems um, because they recognized the value of having that unique ID associated with a child record within their programs for lots of reasons. Um, sometimes that would be for case management connectivity to a district program as families moved around. Um, sometimes it was to do their own research so that they had the ability to follow children into the K-12 system over time. I know one system that uh, continues to be frustrated because they, uh, they can't get a field added into their program data um, for the what we call our MARS number, which is our unique ideas, our child protection or child welfare system. They've been wanting it for years for the same reason, the ability to just understand and connect better with school systems because uh, school attendance for partic in particular is such a, a key component of the CFSR reviews that they're all subject to. So I mention that because I think it's important to know that some kind of shared unique identifier is of value above and beyond system integration. And so we didn't have a hard time with some of the pre-K partners that we've got um, convincing them that they should come on board with getting uh, an education ID assigned to their kids because they are already wanting it. Um, we, our linking mechanism that we have, we share it with our K-12 to higher ed system, which is called SLEDS here in Minnesota. And um, it's a 17-step algorithm that we purchased um, 
some time ago, uh, and it's actually, we've outgrown it. And um, it was very expensive. It cost a little over a million dollars, uh, and it, it's, it's got a ton of bells and whistles to it. It's very complicated, um, but it's now too slow for us. So we're in the process of um, exploring another linking, off-the-shelf linking product that will work faster for us. And I mention that because uh, I think the reality is that we're never going to be able to get all of our partners in integrated data systems to take on a unique ID. Um, and certainly that helps to maximize our linking accuracy, but it's, it's not absolutely necessary. We have fairly high um, linking match rates using a whole host of other types of matching. So um, it's useful, but it's not, it's not absolutely necessary. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons I wanted Anita to share was I think there's a lot of states who are in the structure where they've leveraged the UIDs from the K-12 system and batched them down into early childhood programs, which has helped them to move quickly. I think what they're realizing is that there is a speed issue, as Anita mentioned, that I think folks are now recognizing more and more. So that is, for those states who are operational and have moved forward, that's been one of the more uh, quick strategies, I would say, to kind of get them out in front of, like, especially if they're ELC grants and they had to do that. For other states, I think many of them have third-party vendors um, who are helping to match so that it keeps the privacy as a kind of a third group. No one state agency has all the information. Um, some of those are third-party vendors that are like, truly vendors, and some of them are universities. So I think it's really varied across states, but I will say that for, for purposes of Timing, we are seeing more and more of the states leveraging down the K-12 UIBs into the early childhood space. What I really found interesting about Steve's discussion was that you are looking at the health data, the family support services data, and the early childhood data. Can you, and maybe Anita, if you could too, give us a sense of which different data systems you've been able to bring together in this in this pool under EC data, your EC data work? You mentioned Steve. I just remember subsidy and the McV and the Help Me Grow. Like, can you just and WIC and a developmental screening? Was was there anything else I missed there? Um, no, a couple, but, but you're correct. I, I mentioned we're at the Department of Health, and we still have to comply, you know, the, regardless of the, the data sources, of course, with privacy and FERPA and HIPAA and things of that nature. So some data sources may be able to uh, reap uh, more information from the K-12 through system than others, uh, you know, those that are a bit more uh, joined, uh, connected with FERPA. But, uh, you know, through our data sharing agreements and we're working closely with the Privacy Technical Assistance Center as well as the State Education Authority here. And, and so we're very hopeful to be able to evaluate uh, programs. And those that are clearly listed in, in FERPA, you mentioned uh, child care and Head Start and any kind of pre-K that is operated by a local education agency, uh, your, your Part Bs and, and your Part C. But yes, and this is still a work in progress, and Minnesota can and talk because they, they've been able to accomplish some of this, and so I'll let Anita go next. But, but of course, we're also trying to broaden that scope. We're very interested in, in outcomes. Uh, like I mentioned, collective impact, and so what about those children that received WIC services and, and home visiting services? Uh, we have a screening program through our comprehensive uh, uh, systems uh, uh, grant. Um, and then, yes, I also mentioned our, our Help Me Grow. Uh, they're serving families and they're serving, uh, you know, children. So, yes, we have some kind of non-traditional uh, partners with our, in our, our spot here at the Department of Health. But we know uh, in early childhood, we know as early childhood community that all these services, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, hey, those, those children need food <laughs> and then they need, uh, you know, wonderful uh, family interactions. And, and various uh, caregiving support from the community and appropriate transitions into kindergarten. And then, of course, we do all this incredible work, and we want to see that, that uh, those gains are sustained 
from kindergarten into first and second and third grade. And we want to make sure that those third grade language and literacy uh, assessments and scores are, are where they need to be. And uh, from a collective impact the lens, it, it, it takes a village, right? It takes a community. So, yes, we are, we're trying to go outside of some of your traditional uh, sources. And we, we want to look at QRS and uh, we want to look at kindergarten entry assessments for as many children that are participating in these various programs as possible. But let me turn that back uh, to Anita. I know that they've accomplished some of this, as, as has North uh, Carolina. Thanks, Steve. Um, I can, I'll do a couple of things. Um, I, I'll, I'll list off some of the programs that are in our system by department, but then I'd also direct people to our site. We have a button on our site, which is um, the site address is simple. It's eclds.mn.gov, and there's a button that's just simply called About ECLDS Data. Uh, our partners are the Department of Human Services, Health, and Education. And so um, from the Department of Health, we're getting birth records. We're getting um, early hearing detection and intervention. And uh, we're currently working with them to consider some home visiting or some Medicaid data, but that's, that's on, on the, on the to-do list. From our Department of Human Services, we have our Child Care Assistance Program, which is Child Care Subsidy. Uh, child Protection is integrated. Our, T our QRIS data is integrated. Economic Assistance Program, specifically our TANF programs, and SNAP, our Food Assistance Program. Um, and then from the Department of Education, we've got our um, Early Childhood Special Education Family and Child Outcomes. We have uh, Early Education Student, which I mentioned earlier. We have K-12 Assessment, K-12 Enrollment, um, Kindergarten Entry Profile. Um, ours is only a sample in our state, unfortunately, so that one is a little less useful. And then we've added some information on our Common Core Catalog and our teacher licensing. And the teacher licensing piece is something that we, we don't have any analytics out there yet, but uh, it's our hope to develop some analytics around the early childhood workforce that provides us with uh, more granular information about credentialing of our um, early childhood teachers that are in our state and connected with our kids. So are you integrated with the registry? In Minnesota, like yeah. Do you have a? Okay, yeah. that's yeah. great. They're, they're, our registry and our quality rating system are together under one umbrella in our state. I see. Yeah. That's great. I, I have a, a final wrap-up question. We kind of heard a little bit of this, but if you could mention again in Minnesota. What do you think is, is next, or like if you could, knowing the questions that people are asking, how they're using the data you have from your work with the EC data group, um, a lot of ideas about potentiality with reports and things like that, you know, what, what are your next visions? And obviously doing this work prepares you for, you know, knowing what you want to do next in a more clear way and what the next step are. As you're working on this, it's almost creating a map moving forward. Um, so, Anita, if, if you could address, what do, what do you think is like some of the next things that you're really interested in seeing developed or that you see potential for with the work that you've done so far? One of the things that I watch for is uh, excitement that occurs just organically. And by that I mean we get early adopters, folks who want to be integrated, um, and they immediately see the benefits to their work, particularly when it involves collaboration I I with another system. Um, one of the best examples we have is um, our early hearing detection and intervention program over at our Department of Health is a recent addition to our site. And they do a lot of collaborating with the early childhood special education staff at the Department of Ed. And they have, they've been so excited. It's just like it has its own momentum. And they're using the integration of their data to improve their collaborative work on behalf of kids and families. That's what I want to see. That's what I get excited about. And I think that's, that goes back to um, 
I think Phil's earlier statement about data integration and data use doesn't, it isn't a separate thing you do. It becomes part of how you do your work. And that's what I want our next steps to be. And I'm seeing little bits and pieces of it uh, crop up, and it does. It happens on its own. And I love that because I don't want our ECLDS to continue to be Anita's data project. It has to take on a life of its own. It has to become institutionalized. Others have to begin owning it and getting excited about it. And that's what I think the next uh, step is for data use around integrated data systems here in our state. You know, that's so exciting what you're talking about there, and it really seems like this activity and this work continues the ultimate vision of breaking down the silos and getting people to understand more what the other, especially cross-sector, um, uh, even beyond cross-programs, but what people are working on in the state, the information they have available, and how to connect the work with each other even in a stronger way. Yep, within. absolutely. Yeah, that's so neat. Steve, is there anything else that you would add on what you've already said um, uh, uh, about um, you know, what you see as next or on the horizon or the potential? Steve. Did you mute yourself? Maybe you had to. Okay, so um, Phil and Missy, is there anything else that you'd like to add in to help us wrap up and conclude here about what you, Phil, you've addressed, and Missy, you have too, a little bit about the vision of how this project can really help and support states and you know, bring them to the next level of collaboration, cross-sector, cross-program, and, um, and really it's, it's like a capstone on all the siloed work people have been doing running projects to get into something like this. Any final words that either of you would like to share? I don't have any. I, I would just say thank you so much for having us today, Deb. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about this and share about the group and just kind of be able to have, continue to move this conversation forward. I, I appreciate the question about what's next. I think there's a lot of really exciting things that states are doing, including Utah and Minnesota, as well as many others. So really excited and, and glad to share this with you. Yes, I agree. And I just think that this is um, it, this is a good time, I think, also for, for us to be talking about some of the emerging challenges that states face at various stages of the work. So, so um, thank you for letting us sort of come on and, and, and talk. Well, we'll have to hear again from you all after um, Texas and Georgia get through their initial phases of the work and also from Utah and Minnesota you know, reflections a year later, um, but congratulations on all the interesting and important um, work you're doing in the States, and thank you so much for coming on with us today. Goodbye. Okay.